Thank you, and also thanks for putting this event together. I do think these are issues where we probably all have more questions than answers. No. Education used to be about reading math and science, and today it's about agency. It's about identity. It's about purpose. No. Sort of the industrial age taught us how to educate second-class robots, no, people who are very good at repeating what we tell them. I think in the time in which we live, in this time of acceleration in the digital age, we need to think much harder about what makes us human. How do we complement, not substitute, the skills that we have created in our computers? If you think about digitalization, it's incredibly democratizing. Everybody can collaborate. Everybody can contribute. But it's also concentrating power at a rate we've never seen before. Technology is incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard everywhere. But it's also incredibly homogenizing, squashing individual differences, cultural uniqueness, meshing everything together. Technology is incredibly empowering. If you go out on the street, you know, the most successful companies are created not by a big industry, but by a big idea these days. They have the product before they have the money. But at the very same time, technology is also incredibly disempowering. You know, when we become the slaves of algorithms that tell us you know, whether to turn right, left and right and who understand maybe our ideas and feelings better than we understand them ourselves. And where we end up on this has a lot to do with how we educate our children and ourselves. Education or schooling used to be about teaching people something. Today is about you know, helping people develop a reliable compass and the navigation tools to find your own way in a world that is increasingly volatile, complex, ambiguous, and so on. And you can see this on our labor markets. Uh, this is about the evolution of labor demand. You can see we are doing less work with our hands. Now robots are taking over whole factories. But actually, the steepest decline in the demand for skills is no longer in you know, manual skills, but in routine cognitive skills. The kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, are precisely the kind of things that are also easy to digitize, to automate, to outsource. This is putting our schools in fundamental kind of challenges. Some people have called this a race between technology and education. Before the first industrial revolution, you know, neither education nor technology was particularly important for the vast majority of people. People were happy in their farms, very self-sufficient. Education technology didn't matter. And then came the first industrial revolution that putting technology ahead of people. And today, you know, we benefit from the industrial revolution, but you wouldn't have wanted to live in those times. Most people suffered very, very badly because they were not prepared for the norms of the industrial age. They didn't have the kind of skills. But then, you know, that was the time when we invented schooling, you know, making people compatible with the norms of the industrial age. You know, you come to work on time, you work in the rhythm of machines, compliance, compatibility, predictability, all those kinds of attributes that were very important. And it generated, you know, generations of prosperity. But, you know, we didn't change that model since those days. And today we have this digital revolution that puts everything into question. And again, what we see is technology is racing ahead of people. We have you know, university graduates you know, having difficulty finding a job, and at the same time, employers say they cannot find the people with the skills they need. Something is happening. And again, we are seeing this level of social pain, this mismatch between what our times demand and what we actually provide. Same phenomenon. In a way, we have designed our schools like a farm. You know, here are the cows, here are the pigs, you know, everybody working in their little boxes. The school of the future needs to be a lot more like a zoo, you know, where we respect the individual differences. Schooling in the past was about the right to be equal. Schooling in the future is about the right to be different. Very, very significant challenges ahead of us. And of course, you know, knowledge has been you know, growing exponentially. And it's filled with so many facets and ideas. And those facets always come with people. That's something very important. Learning is not a transactional phenomenon. 
Learning is a relational phenomenon. The kind of things you studied in school had a lot to do with the people you met, the teachers you met, the personality, whether they recognized your personality. Unfortunately, what we have done you know, in the last you know, decades is making schooling and education very much a commodity. Students are consumers, you know, parents are clients, teachers are service providers. And that's actually part of the problem. Learning is a relational phenomenon. And you know, the world of the curriculum is a very tiny box in this. And what we're trying to do is squeeze all of this in this tiny box. And what happens is typically when those things end up in the school curriculum, the beautiful features of the world become very shallow shadows of themselves. You know, when we test young people at age 10, everybody's enthusiastic about science. No? Science is about watching nature, you know, playing, finding out you know, cause and effect, you know, experimenting. When we ask people at the age of 15 in our PISA test, everybody's hating science. No? Science has become sort of a world of formulas and equations that have nothing to do with the ideas of science. No? That's what's end up in the box. And you know, our response to this is put more and more and more things on the box. Every day, somebody has an idea of you know, putting it into the schooling system. That's why our education system has become a kind of mile wide and an inch deep. No? We forget you know, the essence of skills. And again, you know, what makes us different from the artificial intelligence that we have created in our computers? No? The realm of ethics and judgment. And if you think about artificial intelligence, it's a great amplifier. It's a great accelerator. But it accelerates bad ideas as much as good ideas. And it makes the human capacity to distinguish between right and wrong. And that's about creativity as well. You know, finding out. You know, so important. You know. The realm of you know, the economic life. The realm of creativity, aesthetics, and design. You know, of political and civic life. And those are the central questions that we need to bring to the core of education. If you think about you know, fostering creativity in school, knowledge is always important. You know, I don't discount knowledge. But we are seeing a shift from content knowledge to epistemic understanding. The modern world no longer rewards you just for what you know. Now, Google knows everything. The modern world rewards you for what you can do with what you know. That's the big differentiator. No? Not what you know in physics, chemistry, but can you think like a scientist? Can you design an experiment? Can you distinguish questions that are scientifically investigable from those that are not? Can you think like an historian? History is not about you know, names and places and people. History is about understanding how the narrative of a society has emerged, how it has developed, advanced, and sometimes unravels when the context changes. Those are the kinds of things. That, and that has to do with creating and designing ideas. The capacity of people to think across the boundaries of disciplines. No? Innovation is no longer about knowledge in a silo. It's about your capacity to connect the dots where the next innovation is going to come from. No? Skills. No? Creativity and critical thinking come into our mind. Of course, cognitive skills. But they're not alone. Social and emotional skills are actually also on the rise. Now, our capacity to you know, take perspective. No? to actually you know, be curious, be courageous, provide leadership. You know, those social and emotional skills are also a very, very important part of creativity. Creativity is not just about you know, <clears throat> those ideas. No. Now, when it comes to schools, if we had to make a you know, choice, we can make a long list of things that are important. If you ask me to put three things together, the first is our capacity to imagine to create something of intrinsic, positive voice. That's probably what distinguishes us most from technology of our times. No? Technology is very, very good to extrapolate from what we know. Our human capacity is actually to think around the next corner, no? to imagine. It's also about you know, taking responsibility, mobilizing our cognitive, social, and emotional resources to do something. No? A lot of things in life we know. A lot of things in life we can do. But whether we actually take action is a very different question. And then the capacity to navigate ambiguity. Now, the world is no longer black and white. It's not so, not so easy to see the path forward. Often, we have to manage and reconcile tensions and dilemmas. No? Navigate ambiguity. And that's also the imagination, creativity, so important. Now, what does this mean for our schooling? No? 
The first is openness. We're very, very good in school to teach young people the established wisdom of our times. We're not as good in helping people question the established wisdom of our times. And I think the example of Linaro is a great example of this. Reflection, to be able to step back, to see the bigger picture, to see the forest among the trees. Those are very, very important pedagogical implications of this. Let me show you just a couple of examples. We have at the OECD, through our PISA comparisons, track sort of knowledge and skills. And when I talk about reading in the year 2000, when we started with this, it was a very simple construct. It was about you know, extracting knowledge from books that had been written by someone else. You know, and you could generally trust what you read to be true. If you look up things on Google today, you know, you get 100,000 answers to your question and nobody tells you what is right and what is wrong, what is true, what is not true. Literacy is no longer about extracting knowledge. Literacy is about constructing knowledge. Triangle at different perspectives, ideas. Creativity is part of this. And when you actually see between 2002, uh, 2000, 2003, and average across OECD countries, have seen no evolution in this. And then technology started to kick in. Remember, you know, MySpace, YouTube coming up. In 2006, when we did our third PISA assessment, that was the year before the iPhone was invented. No? Twitter was still a sound. No? The Amazon still a river. Then 2009, social media coming into play. No? You can actually see, you know, the world around us is fundamentally putting into question the traditional skills, and our education systems haven't really responded to this. And 2012, you know, robotics, cloud computing, biogenetics, big data. Or 2015, you know, the emergence of artificial intelligence. And again, you know, our schools have been captured by the past. Education is a very conservative social enterprise. And we are part of the problem, we as parents. We get very anxious when our children no longer learn things that were very important for us. And even more so when they learn things that we no longer understand. Teachers are more likely to teach how they were taught than how they were taught to teach. It's a big dilemma. And you know, <clears throat> the biggest sort of issue is you know, when you ask how, what's the share of young people who can distinguish fact from opinion? One in 10. It's a little bit better than in the year 2000. It was you know, 7%. But we live in a totally different world. And the world around us has fundamentally changed. Human capacities are still not evolving. Fortunately, you know, there are always some countries that are doing better than this. In this kind of knowledge and information management kind of capacities in which creativity is a very, very important element. Some provinces in China do very well. Singapore has moved from good to great. Number one in the OECD is now Estonia. Tiny countries in the north of Europe has really managed fundamentally to change its education system. Technology-rich experience, providing teachers with the discretion and the autonomy to change the environment around us. Portugal, Poland. Portugal used to be one of the most sclerotic kind of education systems. Today it's one full of entrepreneurialism where schools have discretion you know, to think about the environment in which they want to work. At the bottom of the scale, you have countries like Peru and even Albania making progress. Countries like Brazil or maybe Turkey look less impressive of this, but at least they've got more children into school. So in this overall depressive picture of very little progress, we've seen some countries actually moving forward. And I think that should give us encouragement that we can do a lot better than this. And it's not just about learning time. You know, here you can see in blue the amount of time that students spend learning in school, in yellow the time they spend learning out of school, you know, homework, things like this. And the United Arab Emirates is number one. You know, students spend close to 60 hours learning. And then you compare that with Finland, it's a little bit more than half than that. You know. But when you look at productivity, you can see in a country like Finland, students learn a lot in very little time. Whereas in the United Arab Emirates, they spend a lot of time and learn very little. That really shows us it's not about the volume of learning experience, it's about the quality, the relational quality of educational experience that really matters. Let me bring creativity more directly into this. Growth mindset. When we ask young people, you know, what makes you successful in mathematics? The majority of French students told us, oh, it's clear, it's all about talent. You know? If I'm not born as a genius, I'm going to study something else. If you ask an Estonian student no, or Singaporean student, nine out of 10 students tell you 
If I study really, really hard, I know my teacher's going to help me and I'm going to be successful. And that growth mindset is a source of energy. You can basically see here, you know, countries line up pretty well in terms of the quality of their learning outcomes and that kind of growth mindset that we can instill in people. It's not something that we're born with that we can actually create. And you can see actually fear of failure. Growth mindset is one of the biggest predictors for people to actually to overcome failure, to accept failure. And then again, you know, if you want people to be creative, you have to allow them to take risks, to experiment. And if they're too experiment, they're going to make mistakes. And if your education system is not good in accepting and tolerating mistakes, you will not see people being creative. And you can see growth mindset and those things are very, very strongly related to this. Even people with a growth mindset are seeing more of the value of school. So it's about the social experience. Teacher enthusiasm, one of the best predictors. Of course, you know, the quality of teachers, the knowledge of teachers, all of that matters. But the simple fact whether teachers felt, you know, whether students felt my teacher has a passion for what they teach, they has a passion for teaching us as students. Those things were some of the best predictors we get in our PISA test for the quality of learning outcomes. So these are the ways in which we can change those outcomes. It's not just about academic outcomes, even life satisfaction. You might think, you know, whether students are happy with their lives depends on, you know, things like, you know, uh, the, the friends, the families, and so on. Yeah, of course. But school has a huge influence on student satisfaction with lives. The climate in school, the teacher feedback, the teacher support, whether learning is cooperative and not competitive. Those things matter a lot. What kind of learning environments to create? It's about co-creation. Creativity is about co-creation. You can see it varies a lot across countries. You have some countries here like the Netherlands, Denmark, Japan, Germany, where learning is a collaborative experience because pedagogies are collaborative. At the other end, you look at the United States, at Malta, at Brazil, at the United Kingdom. We design very competitive education systems. And that is something that has to do with quality of experience and lives. So, in a nutshell, let me conclude this. If to move you know, from the past to the future to a system in which creativity is the heart and not an annex, basically, means that you know, we have to get away from sorting people to actually ensuring and helping everybody to succeed, understanding how different students learn differently and engaging with, that, with this diversity, this differentiated pedagogical practice. We have to, and that's something that is actually possible. We have to move from you know, teaching people you know, something to helping them build that reliable complex. It's about complex ways of thinking, complex ways of working, co-creation, collective capacity. And that, of course, requires a very different caliber of teachers and teaching. People who are not just you know, broadcasting knowledge, but people who understand how different students learn differently. And those kinds of people don't like to work in the factories that we have designed in our schools. They expect a collegial kind of work organization. And if you want to see this at work, you know, go to countries like Estonia. You will not recognize the experience of schooling there. Well, thank you very much.